And well, uh, welcome everyone um, to this second, I believe, uh, recent Simone Bay Center um, Zoom conference. Uh, we're really glad that you could join us today. We have an excellent conversation for you. Um, first, a little bit about us. The Simone Weil Center uh, was founded by me and Paul Grenier and um, Matthew Del Santo a couple of years ago to, um, to seek a politics that truly aims at the common good. Um, our general sense was that the liberal consensus that had um, held together a lot of the political forms of the world was um, was showing itself to be unstable and um, incomplete, but there are many goods of liberalism that we don't want to throw out. Um, we need to rethink the fundamental ideas and institutions that our political order is based on. Um, that conversation had been happening in the Anglosphere and in America and, to, um, and also in, in England for a number of years, but those conversations were um, sort of uh, limited to local questions um, or national questions and were very, very Anglo-centric. Um, so what we wanted to do was broaden that out. Um, so the Simone Weil Center exists to foster dialogue, diplomacy and debate um, about the future of the political at the national and international levels. At home, we argue for a domestic politics which understands that the common good is not some optional extra, but is instead something crucial to our personal and mutual flourishing. Internationally, we promote an order in which the highest achievements of varied cultures and spiritual traditions are maintained, thereby allowing a diverse and plural community of nations, states, and peoples. Um, our participants are eminent, um, and I look forward to hearing what they have to say. Um, Vasily Shipkov, who will be joining us as shortly, we think, um, is associate professor at um, MGIMO University of the Moscow State Institute of International Relations and director as well of the Russian Expert School. He's a longtime friend and associate of the Simon Bay Center and helped us organize our first SWC conference in Moscow in 2017. Uh, Matthew Del Santo is executive director of the Simon Bay Center um, and he is a contributing editor to its journal Landmarks, um, which Oh, that's another sort of a bit of an um, announcement. We have a new journal coming up, coming out, um, which now has a web presence and will shortly have more of a substantial one. Um, his book, Theokratia, Nicholas II, The Revolution and a 21st Century Russian Political Theology is an interpretive essay on the theocratic principle in Russian culture and it is forthcoming with Princeton University Press. Paul Grenier is president of the Simone Weil Center. He has worked variously in think tanks as a simultaneous interpreter and translator for the State Department and somewhat incongruously, but with relish in urban economic development. He writes frequently on political philosophy and international affairs and helps manage landmarks. Michael Martin is the director of the Center for Sociological Studies and an active member of the Simon Weil Center and has been from the beginning of his many books of particular interest in the present context is his The Submerged Reality, Sociology and the Turn to a Poetic Metaphysics which draws on and amplifies the idea of several of the Russian philosophers whose names will undoubtedly come up during our discussion today. He is also a farmer and professor of philosophy and literature, and he has large quantities of children. I can't remember how many. Um, let's see. Uh, our moderator, Nikolai <coughs> Petro, is a professor of political science at the University of Rhode Island. He is currently working on a book tentatively entitled The Tragedy of Ukraine, what classical Greek tragedy teaches about conflict resolution. I am Susanna Black. I am the um, editorial director at, at the Simone Weil Center and I'm the editor in chief of Landmarks. I'm also a co-founder. And I also edit a lot of other things which you can ask me about as you see fit. Um, I would now like to turn this over to uh, Nikolai. And just FYI, if you have any questions, which I'm sure you will, um, just as we go along, don't wait until the end, but as we go along, just type those questions in the chat, ignore the Q&A function, but the chat ought to be enabled for you. So um, with that said, uh, Nikolai, I'm turning this over to you. Thank you very much, Susanna. <clears throat> so without uh, further ado, uh, since we've covered everything, um, I'll start my presentation. 
Just to remind everyone, though, uh, the order will be myself, then uh, Professor uh, Shipkov, then Michael Martin, then Paul Grenier, and then Matthew Del Santo. We'll be collecting your questions throughout, and then um, we'll be addressing those after all of the presentations are done. So my presentation is about tragedy and politics, although the topic, both of those are actually uh, large, virtually universal. I'm gonna to try to fit everything into less than 10 minutes. When we refer to something as a tragedy, we typically mean that something bad has happened over which we have no control. Indeed, it is precisely our powerlessness to change these circumstances that we deem tragic. For the ancient Greeks, and I'm thinking primarily of the Athenians. Uh, tragedy, however, was something that human beings create by virtue of our obtuseness. The gods set up the conditions of our existence, but it is our pride and arrogance that leads us to make choices that give offense to others and then sparks their desire for revenge. So tragedy is not fated. It is something that we can control once we recognize our own role in creating it. The repetition of offense followed by revenge, followed by renewed offense is called a tragic cycle. It repeats until it is broken. But this too is a choice that individuals must make. Therefore, understanding tragedy as the Greeks did rather than as we tend to do now, I believe helps to restore human agency to politics. And hence, my most succinct definition of tragedy is this. Tragedy results when, by trying to correct an injustice, we unwittingly perpetuate it. So the purpose of the performance of Greek tragedies was to teach citizens how to bring about an end to chaos and to restore order in their midst. It was literally a civic function designed to create better citizens. Through the validation of the proper order of things, the citizenry could be led away from hubris toward catharsis. This is done through dialogue, reconcil reconciliation, and ultimately compassion, compassion for one's enemies, for unless Athenians could learn to share in the suffering of others, the circle or the cycle of tragedy could never be brought to a close. Tragedy's most important function to spark a dialogue among the citizenry on proper civic values and behavior has been all but forgotten. Many social scientists today reject the tragic underpinnings of political realism. Even modern realists tend to see in tragedy only a reminder that politics can never result in anything but imperfect compromises. This perspective has prevented us from appreciating tragedy's therapeutic potential. The Greeks, by contrast, saw tragedy as a way to shape the character of Athenian citizens by demonstrating the proper context of a noble soul and the type of actions that would be most beneficial to the community. This difference between classical Greek tragedy and political realism today has important implications. Political realists today generally pay too little attention to the social component of hamartia, error or misjudgment and as a result, rarely mention catharsis, which is crucial to the healing, not only of the individual, but of societies as a whole. Classical Greek tragedy forces people to reflect on what is timeless about the human condition by setting itself the task of improving the moral character and judgment of the citizenry and thus of the polis, the community as a whole. It is this improvement of the whole political community rather than just its individual components 
that modern social science seems to have all but abandoned. Many people, even some diplomats and politicians, excuse me, no longer understand the actual purpose of dialogue. They think it means something like communicating, communicating one's desires to another party. But a prison warden does this with his inmates. One of the most ancient meanings of the word logos means to gather together. Some scholars argue that in English, the best rendering of logos is relationship. And in this vein, we can hear the opening words of the gospel according to St. John the theologian in a new context. In the beginning was the relationship. Dialogue differs from conversation, from discussion, from debate by being more concerned about the relationship of the participants than it is about the topic at hand. Its objective is not the achievement of a momentary agreement, but a self-transformation that will allow this and future agreements to be honored by establishing a new relationship. It is, in William Isaac's words, a conversation with a center, not sides. Classical Greek tragedy is thus quintessentially a series of dialogues that expose us to our own tragic flaws. This exposure is meant to bring about a catharsis, a purging of the soul that restores healthy perspective by removing toxic emotions and ambitions. It is therefore both improper and misleading to characterize the Obama administration's reset as an attempt to foster dialogue, drawing a distinction between technical agreements that were possible and values disagreements <coughs> over which there was no ability to discuss even, as the authors of the reset did, is the exact opposite of true dialogue. If tragedy results when social actors unwittingly perpetuate injustice through their efforts to abolish it, this implies that if the actors ever recognize this connection and change their behavior, the tragic cycle could be at least temporarily broken. In his final play of the Oresteia trilogy, Aeschylus lays out, I believe, a comprehensive strategy for doing so. In a nutshell, it boils down to this. The protagonists must embrace a compassionate justice that extends to all rather than their own partial justice, which is only for the few, namely for themselves, and which is synonymous most typically with revenge. I won't go through what each of the five steps are, except, except perhaps in the discussion if you want to, but at the end, it all boils down to fostering social harmony, which is established when former enemies become stakeholders in a new social order by joining new institutions that have been created to allow them to join thereby completing the process of social transformation. Now I have two, uh, a few thoughts about how to apply this ancient uh, remedy to social ills uh, today. I believe it could be applied in Ukraine uh, and, if, and doing so uh, would certainly uh, promote true healing uh, in that uh, society, that divided society. Like the Peloponnesian War, which Simon Critchley is aptly described as a long suicide, the crisis in Ukraine is a classic tragedy. In describing it as such, I'm trying to highlight not only the cyclical nature of the internal conflict, but also to suggest a way out. If Ukrainian history is a cycle of mutual grievances, which are rooted in the attempt of its two distinctive political cultures, the Galician political culture in the four Western providence and Malaros uh, Ukrainian culture uh, <coughs> east of the Dnieper, on the right banks of the Dnieper, on uh, the left bank of the Dnieper, to resolve the issue of who gets to define Ukrainian identity, 
then the solution lies in recognizing how the very effort to fix Ukraine is in fact perpetuating the tragic cycle. Nationalism seems to many Ukrainians and uh, other analysts outside of Ukraine to offer a speedy, albeit violent remedy to these problems by imposing unity. The difficulty with a nationalist remedy, however, is that it ultimately aggravates these problems. For harmony to be restored, society must embrace a form of justice that is not revenge, that is acceptable to all parties in the conflict. And this means involving the other, the enemy, in the construction and preservation of society. This is precisely what Ukrainian governments have failed to do for the past three decades. They have instead acted like the furies of old, driven by a sense of righteous vengeance, both against Russia and against their own Russophone citizens, who are frequently vilified as a fifth column for Russia inside Ukraine. Breaking the tragic cycle will therefore require that this so-called fifth column be given a meaningful stake in the social order. And lastly, uh, I'd like to uh, give you some thoughts about how tragedy, tragedy's therapy might apply in Russian-American relations. There's actually more of a literature on the meaning of tragedy and a tragic worldview in international politics. In international relations, true dialogue implies a willingness to question the primacy of any world order, including the liberal world order. It also means, I think, abandoning a view of the liberal world order as a set of cultural values that the West must impose on the rest of the world. Pragmatically, however, one must acknowledge the tremendous fear of Western elites that this will mean the end of Western dominance from which Western citizens have derived so much benefit in many ways. One way to overcome this fear might be to show Western elites how they could benefit from a more pluralistic world and from specifically cooperative global ventures that are not predicated exclusively on Western leadership. For example, it could be argued that by sharing the burden of maintaining order throughout the world with local regional hegemons, the West could match defense spending to the actual needs of its defense, rather than to the unbridled costs of maintaining global leadership. This would free up enormous domestic resources especially notable during this time of prolonged global recession. Moreover, sharing the cost of global security would set a very good example for global burden sharing in other vital areas where it is long overdue, such as climate change and global disease control. I am not at all sanguine that this will happen, but I feel that without clearly identifying the tragic reasons for our repeated failures, the chances of finding any workable solutions to such problems becomes even more remote. So on that note, I would like to, uh, I see that uh, Vasily Alexander Sh uh, Shipkov has joined us and I would like to invite him <laughs> to uh, carry the baton further uh, now and be our second presenter. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all for invitation and I welcome all participants and all viewers of our meeting. Uh, the question of uh, conference is what Russia is. And this question have, um, has three answers. Russia is the West, Russia is the East and a part of, of collective non-Western countries. And also Russia is an independent country civilization. These answers are different, not because Russia is something mysterious country, there is no secret in Russia. Uh, there are also no different Russias, white or red, one of westernizers or one of Slavophiles, monarchist, Soviet or democratic. Uh, and I have three uh, points. Firstly, uh, for a market economy, Russia is a peripheral country and uh, a part of big West like China or India. Uh, 
It has always been this way because the capitalist culture, core of this culture, is located in Western Christianity. This happened after the revolution of nominalism in the Middle Ages. The theological party of nominalists has raised the question of abstract being above the question of concrete telos, above a concrete personality, or as Greek, uh, Greeks say, hypostasis. It was uh, such a world view that was able to place the abstract power of money above the mysticism of the personality. But the West itself and Latin Christianity, of course, are not capitalist itself from its origin. Therefore, orthodoxy cannot become the basis for globalist ideology. It cannot be the economic core of the market. For this, orthodoxy would need to change its dogmatics, but then it will cease to be orthodoxy. Therefore, on the map of the global world as a capitalist world, Russia is the periphery of the West. By the way, the West has never been afraid of Russia as an economic competitor. Secondly, the East is a category that is generated by the global Western culture. It is a Western category. The East means the same as the global economic periphery. Therefore, Russia is the East only as a part of the Western picture of the world. The dispute about Western or Eastern nature of Russia and of Russian culture is an entirely capitalist discourse. Third, Russia is a, an independent civilization. The core of civilization in Russia is religious, just like one in China, Iran, India, and other big powers. It, uh, it's simple, and it sounds simple. But the problem is that this core, this civilization core, is orthodox. It is Christian, but neither Catholic nor Protestant. And this is the difficulty. Russians, just like Western Christians, think of themselves as universal people. But at the same time, Russian culture is alien to globalism. Russian culture has a deep confidence in the fundamental equality of all people before God, which makes it gene genetically anti-fascist. The same confidence periodically deprives Russia of a sense of self-preservation. Russia, I would say, is too trusting and easily opens up to the world, trying to build relationships with everyone, with cultures and uh, other countries, uh, as with members, members of its own family, as with brothers. Uh, Russian anti-Westernism and anti-globalism have always been devoid of any ethno-nationalistic and racist forms. It was alien to any fencing off from the outside world. Uh, even uh, the Iron Curtain, figuratively speaking, was made not only by Soviet Russia, but also by the West. Mm -hmm. And we must not forget that it was Russia uh, that destroyed the Berlin Wall. All the illogically and complexity in understanding Russia lies entirely in the plane of understanding of Russian Orthodox, I would say Russian Orthodox Catholicity by Western Christianity. Uh, the question of Russian identity today can be solved in the West only is the question of the identity of the West itself. The West is now fencing, fencing a serious identity crisis. The challenge of uh, a new religious world order, a new post-secular mysticism leads the West to the idea that without understanding its own initial basis, its own psychology uh, on which the building, the big building of the Western civilization was built, this building becomes a house of cards that will explode from any terrorist attack, Islamist, racist, or even anti-racist. Money, big money or capital 
cannot exist without a solid social and religious ethical structure. Therefore, today, one of the main scientific tasks for the West itself is to determine the origins of the modern and secular project. More and more researchers, scholars say today that without this, it is impossible to get out of the current crisis. The understanding of Russia in the West will change uh, precisely as we study the West's own civilizational foundations. Instead of concluding, I would like to give my own uh, subjective, of course, forecast for the global future, I think for the 20, uh, 21st century. Orthodoxy will once again face a new global challenges in the 21st century uh, after a brief, I would say, respite after uh, the Soviet period. Uh, but orthodoxy will stand, of course. There will be many new studies in the West, uh, researchers uh, in the West about the theological origins of modernity and secularity. We will see uh, also the emergence of international theological and even po political movements uh, in the West to bring mystical realism back to Western Christianity. Uh, the topic of religious freedom uh, will become the locomotive of the globalist human rights policy. A post-secular era will come, uh, which means a permanent global war of, as we say, sects, uh, non-traditional re uh, religious organizations against traditional, especially Abrahamic confessions. The world is waiting for a left turn after, after which the capitalist core uh, culture of uh, capitalism will begin to transform, maybe moving to the East and at the same time creating its own non-Christian theology. And uh, sharp theological, uh, big theological disputes, uh, I think, will return to the politics uh, we'll get back to the politics uh, and to people's everyday life uh, as it was uh, sometimes in the first uh, centuries of Christianity, in the beginning of our era. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe Michael Martin is next. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I, th I, I chose to speak about uh, Nikola Berjaev's eschatology. It's like, I, I don't know, but I can't stop thinking about eschatology these days. <laughs> for Nikolai Berdyaev, philosophy is many things, but it is in no way an academic exercise performed for one's peers. The idea of conformity to the, to the opinions of even a highly cultured group repelled him, as it always compromises the essential freedom of the philosopher who sells his birthright for a plate of lentils by appealing to the crowd, however so sophisticated its opinions. Berjaev holds that philosophy is prim uh, primarily a creative act, and as such, it must resist the temptation of acceptance promised by a professional, by professional approval. As he writes, the high highly cultured band of a certain style usually expresses imitative opinions upon every subject. They are average opinions. They belong to a group, though it may well be that this imitativeness belongs to a cultured elite and to a highly select group. Genius has never been completely able to find a place for itself in culture. And culture has always striven to turn genius from a wild animal into a domestic animal. The philosopher is wild animal, has no place in the domesticated world of the academy. <clears throat> Connected to his ideas on creativeness, Berjaev describes his attention to philosophy as revelation in terms of active eschatology. Active eschatology, he writes, is the justification of the creative power in man. This is so because, he writes, the outpouring of the spirit which changes the world is the activity of the spirit in man himself. Rajiv's active eschatology then speaks to the regeneration of all things or to adopt explicitly religious terminology, their glorification. The idea of theosis, indeed tincture to use Bamian language, all of Berjaev's thought. This glorification approaching from the future, furthermore, resides in the coming of Christ, which moves toward the present just as history moves toward its, its arrival. 
the, the two converging almost in the way of the super collider. But the coming of the eschaton announces itself through anxiety. And while Berjaev is assured of the final victory of Christ, he is not as confident in man's willing participation in the transformations implicit in his arrival. Man, it appears, would, would prefer to hold on to the dead forms of the past, their shells and ghosts, than cooperate with Christ in the regeneration of all things. Certainly something of, of Burma's notion that God's love feels like terror to the sinful as it burns away the impurities of the soul haunts Berjaev's metaphysic here. Man is entering a new cosmos, he writes. All the elements of our epoch were present in the past, but now they are generalized, <clears throat> universalized and revealed in their true aspect. In these days of the world's agony, we feel keenly that we are living in a fallen world, torn asunder by incurable contradictions. The world, he says, is living in a period of bad. Christianity, that is, in its amnesia, has forgotten how to make all things new, as it says here. Since the close of antiquity, Christianity entered the world as a new young force, while now Christianity in its human age is old and burdened with a long history in which Christians have often sinned and betrayed their ideal. And we shall see that the judgment upon history is also a judgment upon Christianity in history. But theosis is not the only thing that characterizes the future. There exists also what we might call a passive eschatology and great danger accompanies it. The defining feature of this passive eschatology has everything to do with the ways in which technology and mechanization transfigure or more accurately disfigure man as their innovations and methods are blindly and uncritically welcomed and incorporated into, into human life. This movement thoroughly compromises the being of man. We face the question, he says, is that being to whom the future belongs to be called man as previously or something other? Given the subsequent colonization of the human person by genetic engineering, hormone treatments, and plastic surgery, just for starters, one would have to conclude that Berjaev was more than prescient. Berjaev, like his contemporaries Martin Heidegger and Rudolf Steiner, warned about the rise of technology and its impact on human flourishing. Though he died in 1948 before the advent of television and well before the totalization of the technological and technocratic, which has become the information revolution and the dominance of social media, his words are startling and to some degree terrifyingly poignant. The, the greatest victories of man, he writes, in the realm of science or in that of the te technical mastery over nature have become the principal cause of man's dehumanization. Man is no longer master of the machines which he has invented. Our contemporary mechanized civilization is fatal to man's inner life, for it destroys his integrity, disfigures his emotional life, makes him the instrument of inhuman processes, and takes away from him all possibility of contemplation by a rapid increase in the tempo of life. This is written in the 30s. <laughs> As we have become all too aware, both capitalism and communism participate in this dehumanization and no existent political structures offer an alternative. The world threatens to become an organized and technicized chaos, he writes, in which only the most terrible forms of idolatry and demon worship can live. For Berjaev though, the rise of the technological colonization of man did not simply happen by accident, rather, it is the result of the breakdown of culture and the failure of Christianity to figure so transfigure society. Influenced by Solovyev's conviction that Western Christianity, while it created a culture, did not create a Christian culture, whereas Eastern Christianity failed to create a culture at all, though its society was Christian, Berjaev lays the blame at the feet of a Christianity mired in its many sins and more invested in preservation of the past than concern about the future. His critique is scathing. We are witnessing a judgment, not on history alone, he writes, but upon Christian humanity. The task of creating a more just and humane social order has fallen into the hands of anti-Christians rather than Christians themselves. The divine has been torn apart from the human. This is the basis of all judgment in the moral sphere, now being passed upon Christianity. Christianity, furthermore, failed to save culture because it's failed to be Christian. 
as he writes. In this visible world, there is no external unity in the church. Its ecumenicity is not completely actualized. Not only the division of the churches and the multiplicity of Christian confessions, but the very fact that there are non-Christian religions in the world at all, and that there is besides an anti-Christian world, proves that the church is still in a merely potential state and that its actualization is still incomplete. In addition, Christianity for Berjaev is too enamored of its own past, thereby neglecting its true vocation. In historical Christianity, he, he writes, the prophetic element inherent in, in it has become enfeebled, and this is why it ceases to play an active and leading role in history. We no longer, longer look to anything but the past and to, and to past illumination, but it is the future which needs lighting up. And not only has the prophetic element become enfeebled, but because it has, so has Christianity to court. Christianity, in the course of its history, he writes, has too often been submissive to brute facts. The leaders of the churches have too often adapted themselves to various political and social orders. And the judgment of the church is only pronounced after the event. The result of this has been a loss of messianic consciousness and an exclusive turning out towards the past. Faced with the realities of Christian history and culture and the, uh, and the impending demonic technicization of man, Rajayev can only conclude that either a new epoch in Christianity is in store for us and a Christian Renaissance will take place or Christianity is doomed to perish. Though he knows full well that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Rajayev wagers on behalf of the church triumphant, but he condemns degenerate Christianity, which he's when he sees it because he knows a failure of culture is at its core a failure of Christianity. He recognizes this paradox. The paradox is that only Christianity can save the world from Christianity. Thus, Brajaya prophesies the, the arrival of a new Christianity, which will rehumanize man in society, culture, and the world, because only in divine humanity, the body of Christ, can man be saved but such gener regeneration is not without conditions. The future, he, he writes, depends upon our will and upon our spiritual efforts. This must be said about the future of the entire world. The part to be played by Christianity will certainly be enormous on condition that its old fictitious forms are left behind, and that its prophetic aspect is revealed as the source of a different attitude towards the social problem. In language resonant to some degree with Teilhard de Chardin's notion of the omega point, Berjaev thinks of all history, all life, as moving towards a central event of absolute importance, the coming, the second coming of the Savior. Furthermore, for Berjaev, Christianity, though it has in large part abdicated its vocation in this world, has, has still not completed its mission. It still has untapped reserves of creativity and revelation which lie dormant through the accretion of centuries and centuries of acquiescence to worldliness. When there is no sense of, of, of creative mission in the church, he writes, spiritual decadence follows. Virgil, among other things, saw that his task was to reawaken Christianity to this mission. In his words, every question has not yet been settled and Christianity is not a finished product, nor will it be finished until the end of time. Its fulfillment corresponds to the coming of the kingdom of God. But if we are looking for this kingdom of God and moving towards it, we cannot be in a static condition. The existence of a static orthodoxy or Catholicism is pure fiction, a piece of mere auto-suggestion, and it arises from the objectification and absolutization of what are simply temporary periods in church life. But one hat must wonder if in this in, in this task of reawakening Christianity failed. The current Christian landscape suggests that for the most part he has. While conservative elements in Christianity look to preserving an imagined past, more liberal elements of Christianity look to the present. The future, it seems, is of no one's concern. Out of sight, out of mind. For Christianity, Brajayev would no doubt observe this is a very real tragedy. Complacency and the bourgeois sensibility that one must be busy doing something alike afflict the Christianity of which Berjaev was so critical. Only revelation, an inherently creative movement, can remedy this. But revelation is the stories of the prophets attest and of which John the Baptist is perhaps the paradigmatic example. 
is usually over unwelcome and the love of it off, off the love it offers is interpreted as a threat. Revelation is a catastrophic transformation of consciousness, writes Burjayev, a radical modification of its structure, almost one might say a creation of new organs of being with functions in another world. Revelation is evolution, is not evolution, but revolution. It is far easier to turn away, get lost in religious nostalgia, find distraction in the politics of the moment, or engage in mindless infotainment and celebrity gossip. So stand we. I cannot decide whether Berjayev's thought is pessimistically optimistic or optimistically pessimistic. He believes in the regeneration of Christianity, of man, of culture, of nature, but sees little evidence of it in the world and even less interest in it. Yet he knows that, bidden or not, the Messiah comes. Like William Butler Yeats, Berjayev is attentive to the tragic nature of revelation as it destroys the falsity of our various temptations and our bourgeois complacencies for surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. Berjayev's radical Christian vision, his prophetic madness and absolute clarity offer much to a postmodern milieu and trapped in its own excesses and excrescences. But will anyone have the time or inclination to listen? So thank you. For, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Um, did, did we lose Nick? Did we lose? It, seem, it seems like uh, Nick may have stepped out for a, a moment. Um, and Susanna, we can't hear you, but I know that it's I'm next up, so I hopefully people can hear yes. me. Paul, well, you are <laughs> okay. next up. Why don't you uh, take it from here, and we will hope that Nick finds his way back to us. Yeah, um, yeah, that that's a shame. It's actually I what I I wanted before. Uh, making a few comments of my own, uh, just comment on on a common theme that I'm seeing uh, or hearing from uh, from everyone who's who's presented so far, uh, in, including uh, Vasily Shipkov and Michael Martin and, and, and Nick and Nick Petro. Um, what, and and it, it's it's interesting because it it serves as a, a kind of introduction to my own discussion of, of the Russian idea. Um, what, what I'm hearing from, from all three of them is that the sources of modernity's vitality lie beyond modernity itself. Um, for, for Nick, it, it has, it, I mean, he, he, he couldn't find a source of the real actual meaning of dialogue without going back to, to, to the ancient Greeks um, or, 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 or to Christianity, uh, that, that of dialogue as an actual Sort of metaphysical unity, and, and not just a trading of of interests uh, or impositions uh, of between more or less powerful partners, and and then with uh, Vasily also, you know the modernity starts with the nominalist revolution, according to many uh, of the critics of, of of liberalism today. So you, you in order to to regain the vitality of of the modern order, you need to go before or beyond. That nominalist order as well, which I, I think is just which is true, uh, and 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 that's the only place you're going to find that refine rediscover the concreteness of the person and the human soul, and, and then and then you know, Berdyaev is very different in his rhetoric and 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 it, and in some to some extent in his theology, but it's still the like the the beyond the technical sort of perversion of the human order is is for Berdyaev and for that whole tradition. It's also beyond modernity clearly. It's it's in, in the sense that it's you know it, it's a a, re, a creativity, but that's drawing from from the from divine wisdom, not not from sort of a arbitrary human making. So I I just think I thought that was interesting that 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 really helps explain the stakes because what I want, really wanted to start with was you know why do, why does this matter why why does it matter what Russia is um, in the first place. Um, and, it, and, it, and I think it's uh, clear that looks. Like, it seems like we've lost Susanna now. Uh, at any rate, a great part of, of the drama of Russian history, as, as far as I can tell, um, at least since Peter the Great and possibly before, is a struggle between whether R Russia will define itself as, as modern 
or, or, or something other than modern. And it's a, it's a drama that continues full force in, into the present day. Um, and I, I, I wanted to, you know, why does that matter to any of us personally? I think that that is, I, I think help is made more clear by an idea from Simone Weil, or Simone Weil, as I, I guess I should say properly, um, is that if the modern world wants people to become, to, to improve by being inspired by what is mediocre. Uh, whereas in fact, according to, to, to Simone Weil, that's, an, that's impossible. It's, it's only the perfect that actually inspires people. And the, and which is, so, which is why Christ uh, uh, is, is central to culture um, and, and, and not, just, not simply to culture, but to the human project as such. So my thesis is that the basic, the, the, the Russian idea as such is, is itself not modern, but Russia is modern and has been for a long time, at least in many ways. So that this is, uh, this is precisely the drama as, as I see it of Russia. It, 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 very much since Peter the Great, but to this very day, the liberals uh, in Russia, of whom I see maybe the paradigmatic case of the Russian liberal modernist would be someone like Dmitry Bikov, uh, uh, Bikov, I, sh I should say, um, who who's, has no interest in the Russian idea. He, he wants to, to launch Russia completely into modernity and, and he, he's willing to, he, there was an article recently in Nezavisamaya Gazeta in which Alexander Tsipko takes Bikov to task for being ready to imitate Lenin in his methods to cause a bloody revolution in his civil war if necessary in order to bring Russia fully into modernity, to make it fully Western, to get rid of the, the Tsar, um, quote unquote, currently um, in the Kremlin from, from Bikov's point of view. So anyway, so but as as to what the Russian idea as such is, uh, I think most in, in the most simple terms, I would say that it's the idea of unity. Um, in its uncorrupted form, in its pure form, that that idea of unity is expressed by by Christ, as as already intimated, um, as the unity of love and freedom. That's definitely, you know, clearly we're, we're talking on the level of ideals, and an idea and an ideal are, are, are necessarily sort of uh, linked after all. Um, but if, if you, in, in the works of the greatest Russian writer and the greatest Russian philosopher, arguably Dostoevsky on the one hand and Solovyov on the other, that's clearly the central idea and central theme of, of their whole work. I, 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 that's, and, and it's the same idea which is carried on in the whole tradition, which uh, is continued uh, in the, in the, throughout the early 20th century and beyond. Um, so the, the, this, you can, you can see this idea in Dostoevsky in, in a very obvious form that more, more people are familiar with than any of these other authors, whether it's Father Zosima, um, in the Brothers Karamazov, um, as, as this sort of reflection of, of, of freedom and, and love is, is, is a very obvious example, but it's also part of Russian culture itself. And, 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 and if you think about the fact that, you know, Dostoevsky and Solovyov, who were friends, they went to the Optina uh, monastery together to visit uh, the elders who themselves were essentially, you know, for, for those from whom the model of someone like uh, uh, Zosima was taken in the first place. And I tend to follow on Facebook uh, a lot of the uh, Russian uh, drama of, of arguments between different uh, Russian intellectuals and, and, and in Russian newspapers, there, there's fierce debates, um, often unfriendly ones between different camps about what Russia really is. And the, there are nationalists in, in Russia, although their thinking is often very vague. It's not precisely ethnocentric, but it's not exactly clear what it is. Um, but, but, then, but then you have someone like a Svetlana Luria, who we've printed in landmarks, um, who recently opened a can of worms by quoting uh, Verdiyayev and Dostoevsky to the effect that without Russian orthodoxy, uh, 
uh, Russia is, is, is garbage, you know, I think was the word she used in, in, in Russian. And that, that created a great fur, but I mean, her, her point was basically the same as the one I'm making now. Um, now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about a specific book, uh, a volume uh, called Landmarks, which was written in 1909 by several represent representatives of the tradition that I just referred to, Dostoevsky and Solovyov primarily, who, uh, who, who they, they wrote a, a book which is basically at, at the period just before the 1917 revolution, essentially, criticizing those who had already begun that revolution in 1905, saying that they're making a mistake and they're going in the wrong, wrong direction. And they're still, still themselves struggling to define what Russia is. If you read the book, you can see that it's a work in progress. It's not a, it's not a defined, careful, sort of Catholic uh, sort of laying out uh, of, uh, of the lo logic of, of the way society should work, uh, guided under, under Christianity. Um, but nonetheless, it's informed by a specific Russian Christian idea of, of what it means to be what, what Russia needs to be. Um, this is an idea that's come up before and, and Vasily pointed to it that they assumed that the Christian idea that they were wedded to was the same one that informed Western Europe. Whether that was still true at the time in 1909 is debatable. I think it's no longer terribly debatable today. Uh, but in any case, the I think the most salient point, and this is the last sort of big, big idea I want to try to share, is that when they refer to Russia as being a Christian civilization, they're referring specifically to a Trinitarian Christianity, um, which means, why, why is that important to stress? If, if it's a Trinitarian Christianity, um, includes the idea that, that the second person of the Trinity, God, in the form of Christ enters into history and becomes a, her, a person and, and, and dies. So that inserts sort of both a, a kind of a tragic beauty, but definitely an, a, a, an idea of tragedy into the very meaning of, of human existence. Uh, it also means that because God entered into the physical world and into time in a particular way, that time and space and history are all transformed and become something different than they would have been otherwise. And this, it's, it's easier to see the importance of this if we reflect on the fact that I think is, is, is undoubted that, that Christianity in the United States in, in particular is Unitarian, not in the sense of belonging to the Unitarian church, but Unitarian in the sense that it's not Trinitarian. Um, the I think that it's, uh, this is a little bit of a parenthetic point, but if you just think about the, the fact that in, in, in the Orthodox East, Easter and the Passion of Christ is the very center of the whole liturgical year, by far the biggest celebration. In, in the West, in, in the Unitarian United States, it, it's, uh, it's Christmas where Christ is maximally distant from the crucifixion, and and it, it can it, and it, it's sort of you can still maintain the idea of the world not being tragic, and uh, the 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 end of, of the and that um, it, it's easier to integrate in, into sort of a, a capitalist order as we can see. Um, the 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 other the other aspect of this is that the the fact of of if if God is for something after this world and beyond this world, which is easier to maintain uh, from a, if Christ didn't fully enter the world, uh, that means that we're in control, which, which is a point where I was a little bit cautious about what I heard uh, from Nick Petro. I'm not sure that the idea of tragedy is reconcilable with the idea of our being in control. Um, I think it, it, it actually, techn the technological mindset, it wants to be able to control what happens. Uh, and that's very much part of the American scientific uh, culture. 
So the, the, the interesting thing is, is, is that uh, this Landmark's book, which I passed over too quickly, already starting in the 1960s and 1970s in Russia, uh, was being read by Russian opposition intellectuals and as, as a way of redefining what Russia was during the communist period itself. And then after the Soviet Union fell, uh, it became kind of like a guidebook for many in Russia, including in circles close to Russian power, power as I, I learned from uh, many of our colleagues in Russia over the years, uh, and some of them who are in think tanks in Russia that, that actually talk with people in, in close to, to power in Russia. What Dmitry Bikov um, has done recently is, is in, in dismissing the Landmarks collection and calling it garbage, is, is really, I think, is to make a statement that, um, that we need to reject um, what the Russian idea altogether um, and, and, and turn towards modernity and modernization. I, I think that, that is, that's precisely what many in the, in the West would welcome because they don't trust the idea of, of Russia having a different idea based on uh, unity around the idea of, of love and freedom in, in Christianity. They, that, is a, that is to be pre-modern and it's dangerous. Um, the the uh, but I, I, I think that what um, the, the spirit of disintegration or, or not willing to have a real dialogue with another country is, is really an expression of the same sort of uh, tragedy of the United States because it, it wants to think of itself as being autonomous. And if it's, if it's autonomous, then it has to be, there can't be another power in the world. It, it, it can only be a hegemon. At, at any rate, uh, I, think, I think that is, uh, that's probably more than 10 minutes at this point. So I'll, I'll hand the, my microphone to Matthew, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, let me just check whether people can hear me. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, uh, I wanted to begin my presentation uh, first of all by saying that a, a couple of things that I've uh, that I've already heard, I think, um, uh, have obvious uh, connections with what I'm about to say, and, and I was really pleased, particularly, to hear a couple of the the, the, the terms that Vasily used: mystical realism. And it gets close to something that um, I want to come back to, but I'll take the liberty of borrowing Vasily's term mystical realism. It wasn't one I was planning to use, but it describes very well what I uh, am hoping um, to get at. Um, one of the things that, well, that I do um, a couple of times a year um, to earn a bit of money is take people to um, Russia. I, I work as an academic uh, tour guide in uh, my in my free time and and this is interesting and this is colored uh, this is relevant to my presentation as much as what we what we always do i take people um to moscow and st petersburg one on one particular itinerary we spend our first night by virtue simply of practicalities in in the domodedovo airport hotel which is like any other airport hotel you might imagine you've ever been in in the world except that it was constructed in about 1980 and uh the very next day, we put them on the bus at seven o'clock in the morning, and by midday, we're at um, the uh, Trinity Sergei Lavra, the Sergei po Sergeyev Posad, north um, of Moscow, um, where we arrange to have lunch in the in the monastery refectory. Now, the, as you can hear, I'm not an American; I'm an Australian, and the group that I the, the groups that I travel with are all Australian, and they're generally um, a generation <laughs> older than me. But the but to observe the effect. Um, on these people um, of stepping into really, you know, the, the, the beating heart of Holy Rus is an interesting thing um, to observe. Already, I mean, I think that you, one of the things that strikes people when they encounter Russian Christianity, for example, is that it is, these are people from, from the West, is that it's very different even from the Christianity they think that they know. It's very different even from something, it's, it's a form of, it's something that ought to be familiar, but which is very, very um, which is strangely 
foreign. And there are a couple of things. Um, it's beautiful. Um, it's also slightly dangerous. There's still this sense in which it's possible to do something wrong in, in a church in Russia. You know, the, the sacred is a holy thing and the holy thing is almost by definition uh, dangerous. You're not allowed to go here. You're not allowed to be in this part of the church if you're not dressed in a, in, in a particular way. There are different rules for dressing, depending on whether you're a man or a woman. So this, there's still a strong sense of, of um, a sense of, you know, the natural law. Men are one thing, women are another thing. Um, and we might be, you know, tourists from the postmodern West, but we have to observe the local rules. Um, as I said, it's beautiful. Um, it's dangerous. Um, it's also aesthetic. Um, one, you know, as, as, as we... As I said, we have lunch in, a, in the monastic refectory, and as we encounter the, the the monks and learn about their lives, these people take it really seriously. There there are more days in the year where they where they're not allowed to eat meat, I think, than when they actually are. You know, and for a lot of people, this actually comes as a, as a surprise. Um, in other words, what I'm getting at is that when people come to Russia from uh, a, a, a contemporary postmodern Western culture, they meet something which I think is very well described by Vasily as, as a form of mystical realism. And in, in answer to my answer to the question, you know, what is Russia? My, uh, my answer to the question is, well, Russia, Russia is also Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And in particular, the, the particular idea within Eastern Orthodox Christianity, it's, uh, it's mystical realism, um, but the and I, I, I Vasily that term, but it's even uh, the term I was originally going to use, and I borrowed this one from the um, the Russian theologian Sergei Bulgakov. It's the idea of theokratia. It's the idea that God is a real presence um, beyond human society. That God is actually not something that man has just created, but exists objectively apart from human society. Um, and in order to relate to relate to whom, to whom man has to adopt a certain a form of behavior that he may um, may or may not have chosen for himself. In other words, it, it, it's, it implies um, a form of asceticism, uh, uh, the idea that truth is external to ourselves and we must conform ourselves to it rather than truth being something that we will into creation according to our own preferences. Um, and this idea that, uh, that, you know, that Russia is Eastern Orthodox Christianity, this idea that it, that it is also at heart um, uh, a, an icon, if you like, I think in a very, uh, in a term very appropriate to Russia of, of an idea of theokratia, of God um, as beyond human society, um, uh, as truth external to human society. Um, Uh, coincides, uh, hits, hits, the West, hits the modern Western visitor so strongly, partly because um, of the nature of uh, both Russian history and also of Western history. What's striking, I think, to the Western visitor in Russia is that this is even possible um, in the year 2020. Um, not only because of the evolution that the world has gone through since during the 20th century, the, the progressive secularization of Western society, but also because of you know, the, Russia's own revolution of 1917. One of the things that people find fascinating, for example, uh, one of the things that I find fascinating when I go to Russia is to, to walk into a Russian Orthodox church and see an icon on the wall of Russia's last Tsar, the man who in any Western history book is one of the great losers of history, um, is there on the wall of a Russian church um, as, you know, as a figure to be venerated. And this, I think, is interesting if you bring it into connection with, uh, his name has already been mentioned before, but the, uh, the Italian Catholic philosopher Augusto del Noce. Um, and one of del Noce's ideas is that all of contemporary history is philosophical history. It's, a, it's, 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 it's the outworking in history of a judgment about philosophy. And that, and that philosophical judgment is that Atheism is, is the natural course of history, that, that history obeys a logic of secularization, that as God's, God's being isn't capable of being proved, we, we must logically, you know, as, as, as rational human beings, em, embrace um, an intellectual standpoint that assumes his non-existence. Now, for Del Noche, the moment in which this logic of secularization, this logic of atheism becomes truly present in history is the Russian Revolution of 1917. To Del Noche, it's, it's Russian 
it, 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 it's, it's the Russian Empire, it's the Russian autocracy, conceived of as a form of theokratia um, that preserves this connection between the sacred um, and the political, um, between the, the, the sacred um, and history, um, longest into the 20th century. And the overthrow, therefore, of, of um, Nicholas II, uh, the Russian autocracy in 1917, is an, is an event um, of, of, of world historical significance because of the philosophical judgment, it seems, to um, validate. Now, what I think is interesting about Russia is that it has reversed, you know, if, if you look at contemporary Russian culture, Russian religious culture at least, it has reversed that judgment on history. If it was possible, say, in 1922, uh, in 1935, in 1974, to say that, you know, the Russian judgment on history was still the judgment rendered in 1917, it's actually no longer possible to say that. And I think that any person who um, encounters Russian culture as it exists today um, has, to, um, has to contend with that fact. And, and its most visible, you know, its, it's most emblematic representation is you know, either you know, an icon of the last imperial family or the icon of the new Russian martyrs, um, at the center of which, you know, it, it's a, a, sacred, a sacred rendition of almost all of the Russian society in a mystical sense, um, with you know, the, the former imperial family in the middle of it and, and, and the ranks of various um, orders of Russian clergy around. Um, so if Russian society has rendered a, a different judgment on 1917, I think that that's what makes it interesting. It's also what makes, it, what makes the encounter with it so um, uh, potentially dangerous um, and also thrilling from a Western point of view. Because our, you know, as Donacci points out, you know, the, 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 the judgment that history, that, that, that the idea that 1917 represents a judgment on history as, um, as, as a validation of, of a logic of secularization wasn't a, ju a, a judgment adopted only in Bolshevik Russia. The Nolch's other point is that um, it's ultimately the same judgment um, that, that Western culture may, re arrives at the same judgment on the basis of the same event and that the history of Western culture and Western society in the 1960s and 70s is an attempt to out secularize um, uh, Soviet society. Um, and in that sense, you know, the, the modern Western person arrives in, in Russia still very much with, um, with, with a judgment on history as one obeying a logic of sec secularization um, and meets a culture that has reversed um, its judgment on, on that very idea. Um, what I think, where I think that leaves Russia is in you know, a very interesting place, also in a very vulnerable place. There's, there's nothing to guarantee necessarily, I don't think, um, that Russia will continue to maintain its current reversal of judgment on history as a logic of secularization. And this, um, this, this plays into the, the age old question of Russia's relationship with modernity. You know, Russia is a modern country, even if its, if its culture maintain, refuses to to the extent that it, that it remains orthodox, refuses to accept um, uh, intellectually um, to build its foundations on the, you know, the fundamental modernist assumption um, of secularization. So uh, to me, you know, to, to go back to the question that, um, that was posed, what is Russia? Russia? Russia is Eastern Orthodoxy. What's at the heart of Eastern Orthodoxy? Um, not, not, not necessarily uh, in an absolute sense, or what, a, what is one of the things at its heart, that is uh, the idea that, um, that, you know, that history doesn't obey a logic of secularization, that all of history is in fact, and this comes back, I think, to Paul's point about, uh, about orthodoxy being a Trinitarian uh, religion. Uh, or history, is, history is to be taken into um, and not separated from um, the, the claims of Christianity. Um, And if, if, if what Russia therefore stands for, in a sense today, is a reversal of the, of the judgment um, of secularization, it stands for a sense of, of the rightful connection, the, right, the, the rightful joining in a certain way of the political and of the sacred. Um, what remains unresolved, I think, in contemporary Russian cu culture is the form that that resolution um, should take. Um, 
And there's almost, I think, a deliberate uh, ambiguity being cultivated here because it's not clear how you can uh, reconcile, to my mind at least, it's still an open question, how you can reconcile um, one of the fundamental, um, you know, the fundamental theocratic principle, if you want to call it that, of orthodoxy um, with, uh, you know, with the demand um, of um, modern reality. Um, to go back to Bulgakov, I think that Bulgakov saw this before the revolution took place. Um, he certainly claims that he saw it before the revolution took place. And one of the things that has inspired me in, in, in sort of the reflection that I've taken on contemporary Russian culture is, is a reflection of Bulgakov's himself, a, a, a recollection of, of a visit of his to Yalta, um, Crimea, significantly enough when it was part of the Russian empire in 1909. Um, and he says up until this point in time, Bulgakov has, been, has gone through um, leaving Christianity. Uh, he's born into a priestly family. He has left Christianity uh, for largely the reasons, I think that um, Michael spelled out, but Yael's reasons that, that he, he saw it as having compromised itself um, through excessive subservience to you know, the, the worldly power. Um, and excessive nostalgia for the past. Um, it, he's gone through a phase of being a Marxist. He's become a liberal. He's begun his return to orthodoxy by 1909. Um, it's the same year in which he publishes his, his essay in Landmarks that Paul has discussed. He goes to Yalta and almost accidentally, he happens to be on the embankment one day when Nicholas II is. Hmm. And uh, I'm just going to take the opportunity um, to read um, his uh, recollection of the event. Um, he says, at that time, by some inward act of, of understanding, the strength of which orthodoxy gave me, my attitude towards the Tsar's authority changed. I became in the full meaning of the word a Tsarist. I realized that in its essence, Tsarist authority is the highest kind of authority that, um, that there is. And that this is not an, on account of its own name, but on account of God's. He then goes on to talk about the incompatibility between um, what he calls a godless democracy um, and the fundamental theocratic nature um, of authority. Um, a watershed, a watershed separates them, he said, either or for and with the Tsar or without the Tsar and against the Tsar. But the whole rev Russian revolution as I knew by personal experience, he says, had always been against the Tsar and for democracy. And it's interesting that he assumes that, omoc that, that mm -hmm. democ democracy must um, be godless. Um, and I think this is because, you know, if, if simply etymologically, de demokratia, democracy, is the opposite of theokratia, theocracy. You either have, you either have a political, political authority that comes down from God with, with, with an objective content, or you have a political authority that wells up from man with an entirely kind of self-willed um, voluntaristic content. Bulgakov wasn't sure how those two things, Bulgakov who believed that Christianity, as much as Berdyayev believed that Christianity was also um, something that, a religion that hallowed the freedom of conscience that you know, made um, uh, you know, man's most intimate freedom, the intimate, the freedom of his own conscience, um, sacred. For Bul Bulgakov, the, the question is, well, how can these two principles, how can the theocratic principle and, 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 and if you like, uh, the democratic principle, at least insofar as it relates to man's conscience rather than to a political order, how can these two things be reconciled? And that is really, I suppose, um, where I see Russia today, how it will reconcile the theocratic principles of its culture with you know, a modern political order um, is a question that I think uh, Russia itself leaves in abeyance. But why Russia is interesting is because over against, well, from my point of view, at least as a Western person, over against a Western culture that has almost, almost completely lost um, any, me any memory of, of theokratia, of, of, of political authority being a sacred thing, of political, um, of the purpose of, 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 of political life having a substantive content that is, you know, um, objectively separate from man's own um, will. You know, Russia remains, Russian culture at least, if not Russia, you know, as a, as a political form, 
or as a political society, Russia as a moral community um, remains um, a, a witness um, to something which I think, um, uh, you know, we're parallelly at, uh, we're, we're, at, we're at great peril in Western society of losing sight of um, altogether. And that many of our current um, discontents um, as Western peoples and Western polities um, can be explained through um, this act of um, forgetting. That's, uh, that's, that's my answer to the question of, of what Russia means. Um, and uh, with that, Susanna, I'll hand the um, microphone back to you, so to speak. Um, well, actually, I'm going to hand the microphone back over to um, Nick, who I think will be asking uh, the participants and himself um, the questions that have come in. And if you've, any of the rest of you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them into the chat. Um, that'd be the easiest way to do it. And I'm actually going to start out with a question of my own before I hand it back over to Nick. Um, and I actually, I have two questions and I, they're quite separate, but I will ask them both um, in, in, in aid of being efficient. Um, so the first is for Paul. You have talked about the Russian idea as a tragic and Trinitarian idea in distinction to America's Unitarian idea. And you've made that, um, those distinctions parallel with um, a focus on Easter as opposed to Christmas. In what possible sense can you call um, Easter a tragedy? It, it certainly isn't, I mean, it, it's a story about, it's a story that ends with a wedding rather than one that ends with um, death and destruction. Uh, well, I, I, I think that to, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, actually what you, what you say reminds me of a friend, uh, Olga uh, Merson, uh, who's a Russian literature professor and Dostoevsky scholar, uh, once responded to an anti-Semitic, uh, what she interpreted as an anti-Semitic uh, attack. Uh, uh, of someone who implied that the fault of Christ's death uh, was, was was the Jewish people, and it, they they murdered him, which would be you know, a tragedy. Uh, but she says there's in a murder trial you have to show the body. You know, where's the body? Because Christ was resurrected. So in that sense, of course, you're right. Um, but my point is simply that. You know what what happens with with Christ coming into the world is that you know, with divine perfection suffers, and the, and you you can't take away the suffering from the crucifixion. You you can't simply negate that as as part of the meaning of Easter, and and I, I think that I think that, that sort of the the Western embrace of tech of sort of technocracy is really the refusal of suffering. That we will will do anything to avoid suffering, uh, because and, and, and I, I I think that the you know, that Christianity should be fun. And there's the you know, there's there's jokes about uh, I can't remember the name of the comedian who, who describes Episcopalian theology as offering the participants the choice between um, death or a piece of cake, and everyone chose cake. Um, so I, I just think that that's, there, there is a difference, but, it, but it actually the idea of the, the idea that, that America is Unitarian and therefore rejects tragedy is actually, I should confess, is not really my own. It's, it's page, the American historian Paige Smith um, who observes that the, even the founders who, who genuinely were you know, developed sort of, they, they weren't deists, but, but like, uh, like Adams was not a deist. He was a genuine believing Christian but he was nonetheless very skeptical about this whole Christ entering into being being really part of the Trinity thing, and and I, I do think and I think that that is it's, it's a longer topic, but I, I do think that it's important to that there, there's no question that there's a rejection of the tragic in American history, and I think it is connected somehow uh, with this different attitude towards the Trinity. But I, I agree with you. Ultimately, Easter is not tragic. Was there a second part of that question, Susanna? Um, there was a second question, but why don't we go on to um, 
asking all the the uh, participants to comment on each other's uh, right. presentations. Uh, could could I offer a, com a commentary? There's also some people waiting in the uh, chat that we could bring on to ask questions directly if if we have enough time. Are people going to be cool with going to one thirty? Yeah. Eddie is here. I think I think you have no choice. Anyways, <laughs> this is this is not a democracy, guys. Okay, right. you're going to have to stay, whether you like it or not. Um, I have one. Uh, Nick, Nick, I just want to suggest we all jump in with a few comments, and then uh, once we've answered each other's comments, try to uh, move on to the uh, questions that have been raised in the chat, which you can all see already, and start to think about the answers to. So, Paul, uh, I, when I was offline due to no fault of my own, uh, I'm sure Paul thought he'd get away with, with uh, saying something about tragedy and control, but I heard that. <laughs> and uh, control is not, it, it, that's a chimera. That, that's just a fantasy. And certainly no Greek tragic author would say anything else. But uh, it is perfectly compatible with the spirit of Greek tragedy and of Christianity to argue that human beings have responsibility. We can't control, but nevertheless, we are responsible for those things which we do do, even in the absence of what might be thought of as an ephemeral the ephemeral goal of total control. In fact, recognizing that we don't have that total control is very much part of tragedy. One of the things that it took me a while to wrap my head around was the fact that uh, uh, when, when reading discussions about tragedy, and by the way, I hasten to point out, I'm not explaining the entire realm of thought and thinking about tragedy. I'm not discussing it as art. I'm not discussing it as psychology. I'm not discussing it in a lot of different ways in which, uh, as burlesque, <laughs> in ways it, it has been presented. I'm only thinking about the civic function, right. which was part of the festival of the Dionysia. And to my way of thinking, it was designed, my understanding of the, of the ritual, was that it was designed this way, both to offer a way to let off steam and to, at the same time, through the ritual, through the process at the beginning and through the, the entire uh, week-long festival, to remind Athenians of what it meant to be an Athenian. All the values that we were, that, that Athenians stood for, and it was a, it was a, a biannual, it was biennial uh, affirmation of this. And it was, a, it, it was the main event. Everything, the, the entire life of the city, the entire commercial life, I would uh, argue, even of the city, revolved around the plays, the evaluation of the plays, the discussion of the plays. All of this was done in public. I think the greatest criticism that you could have uh, of, of tragedy uh, as being applied today is we have nothing like the fora today. We, we, don't, we don't participate in any meaningful, large-scale public discussion of issues. There, there simply is no forum. Uh, whether that could, whether there's a way around that is an interesting uh, thing, but it, it's not about the, well, that. Uh, Nick, I think your, your point is Restoring human agency is all that I'm talking about, but agency is not control. It's no, but the political, but I, I made a note to myself that what you were really talking about was tragedy in within the polis in or in politics, and, and I think you make your I think I think you make a it's very conv convincing what you said. But I wanted to comment on the poem from Pushkin ah, yeah. that you put in the comments. Right. Um, and as my, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I mean, it, it, it's a terrific poem, 
And, but it also makes it a larger point because I mean, and this is a point which comes up often um, among Russians that, uh, that there's a, there was a gulf between culture in Russia and faith that, so that supposedly, and, and some people go so far as to say that, that, that Pushkin, um, after all, you know, if you read his Tales of Belkin or uh, Eugene and Nagin, you know, these, are, these are secular Western works of art. But this shows a very impoverished understanding of Pushkin because the poem from Pushkin, I, people can go to the, to, to the chat and read it. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a very deep Russian Orthodox faith that informs even Pushkin, the, the supposed secular poet. So I mean, I, I think that, that, I thought that was very well, uh, a, a point really well made. Um, but I actually, for, for Matthew, I wanted to ask, you know, what form, you know, what, what form should the political take in Russia? And um, that I had another question, if I can find it, the, there's, it, it, to, 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 to uh, continue on the same question, because if Russia's basic form is orthodox, why should the basic form of Russia be the nation state? Why shouldn't it be an, uh, an orthodox empire? Um, the, first question, the first question you asked was, what, what should Russia's political form be? Was that, right. is, that, right. is that correct? Um, right. And, and if its basic idea is orthodox, why should that form be the nation state? Yeah. Um, on the first, on the the first thing I would say is that if you know, to the extent that Russia is an is an orthodox culture, its political form should, in some sense, be a theokratia. It should be a theocracy. It should be one that acknowledges the sovereignty of God over over human society. Um, how you do that is is uh, how you do that. How you do that is is Another, another question, however, historically how that has been done, we know has been through, this is the point that uh, Bulgakov makes um, in 1918 in, in his, um, his dialogue at the Feast of the Gods. Historically, the way the theocracy was realized was in, in Byzantium and Muscovy alike was through the autocracy, um, the idea of a, a ruler anointed um, by God um, and accountable, responsible, not to, not to the people, um, but to God. Um, how you then reconcile that, and this is where I think the tragic comes into it, how you reconcile that to Bulgakov's other primary commitment, which is, you know, a commitment to human, human freedom and to freedom of conscience, to, you know, the individual's freedom to, to not to be a Christian, to not to be orthodox, um, to be anything else. Um, uh, how you reconcile, which he believes, you know, orthodoxy as Christianity also hallows, how you reconcile those two principles? Um, is where, the, where, where, where I see the sense of tragedy arising. What I would say, I think, is that um, since, since Bulgakov's time, and I think also since Berdyayev's time, where, the, which, where this comes back to Michael's paper, you know, what was really, I think, striking to me about your description of Berdyayev, Michael, was how separate past, present, and future are, and how, you know, how, you know, like they want to tear in separate directions. One of the things that I think has happened theologically since both our writers were writing has sort of been in it, since the rediscovery of liturgy and what liturgy is and how it you know, transcends those three things or unites all of those three things, you know, past, present, and future at one point. And I think that if you're going to then apply, you know, if, 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 the, if, if liturgical reality really is at the heart of, of all reality, if all reality is this Eucharist, um, you know, which is which is which is incarnation and, and Easter, and, and and everything else all at once. Um, you know, this is you know, this is mystical realism because it's both mystical and yet it's it, it is an orthodox sense, real with a capital R. You know, this really is the body and the blood, right? Um, then the political then the political form has to somehow take its cue from this liturgical reality. Now, I would say from, from that point of view, you know, you end up back in something much more like uh, Russia's constitution as it existed between say 1905 and 1917. You know, you have a constitution that was liturgically 
formed you know the the um you know you had a constitution that was shaped by liturgy as well as by written documents um and you had uh, i think you can make a good case that it tried to keep in tension uh, the whole dynamic of the period between 1905 and 1917 was a tension between these two ideas of the theocratia and democratia you know, power coming up from both of directions an attempt to preserve some sort of minimal space for freedom of conscience and and, and minimal uh, uh, well maximally or minimally um, a sense of um, responsibility towards God. So that's the answer to the first question. Why then Russia should be a nation state rather than an, em an empire? Um, I think that um, I'm not sure whether I, I want to go and say that uh, that orthodoxy is, is, is more compatible one, with one or the other of those two ideas, given that um, I think they both come to us primarily in, in the forms that we use them from, from the Western tradition. Um, what I do think is interesting, though, is that when, when orthodoxy has met an empire, it has tended to transform it into something closer to, you know, something closer to a nation. You know, Byzantium becomes reimagined as, um, uh, as as the kingdom of Romania. If you look at if you, if you look at recent studies in Byzantine history, if you look at um, uh, the transfer of the imperial idea to the Third Rome idea to, to Moscow, you then end up with an idea of, of Holy Rus. And one of the things that I think Bulgakov says is interesting about, um, about uh, you know, what, what Russian intellectuals owed, owed to the Slavophiles was, was, was the sense that they had, you know, they, they had grappled with the notion of the nation. And the nation for Bulgakov is is, is it's a it's 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 a historical reality, but it's also a mystical one. And this is where I think you get back to the idea of mystical reality. To Bulgakov, every nation has you know its angel in heaven. This might sound like a crazy idea, but um, the, the the idea is the idea is the sense that the nations are real actors in history. That it's that that um, it's the it's the largest possible perhaps element for um, subjective. Um, historical consciousness for, for historical subjectivity and, and, and agency in history. Um, organized not just around a language or a literature as we might, as Westerners might say, but around a tradition and a tradition, um, a tradition rooted in, 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 a, in a religion and then a, therefore ultimately rooted in a liturgy. So um, yeah, I, that's a convoluted answer to your question, but um, I, the, the short answer would be because of orthodoxy. <laughs> uh, there, can we read well, some of the uh, questions have, in the chat? We have uh, several questions, and I was thinking since they're a little bit uh, divided, I would read them for everyone. Uh, so, uh, two are addressed to Professor Shipkov and one uh, to Matt, and then you could just take it from there. So one uh, question for Professor Shipkov. What signs, if any, does he see within Russia today of a shift from abstract value to mystical personality? What signs? Uh, even if there's a discernible shift in culture, can it really shape the policies of the regime? Another question has to do with uh, the issue, the assertion that the true mark of being Part of the West is participation in nominalism, a concept that uh, I guess Richard Weaver extends to the global economy. Uh, most importantly, Vasily's assertion is dodging the elephant in the room. The fact that the West is in reality quite distinct from the rest of the world, and ultimately designed to conflict with it, as Samuel Huntington has pointed out. Perhaps a better place to start might be to follow Florovsky here and essentially adopt Spengler's understanding of what the West actually is. And the last question in this series is for Matt. I believe this is from Adrian. Couldn't one say that it's only if the highest political authority is officially subject to God that freedom of conscience is possible, where freedom of conscience is inseparable from it where freedom of conscience is inseparable from its ordination to the truth. Yeah. Well, uh, why don't you, does anybody care to respond 
yes, I'm ready to answer the question. Thank you, uh, if I may. Uh, uh -huh, okay. Uh, the first question uh, from the earth, and thank you for this question. I, um, I would say that um, theology and uh, modern politics uh, in Russia and in the West are connected to each other in different ways. Um, in the West, uh, theology uh, precedes politics. Uh, first theology, then politics. In Russia, Western uh, theological ideas, theology um, are already taking place, come from uh, uh, appear in the modern uh, in uh, uh, the modernity in a political form. Uh, we can say they come from the West. Therefore, uh, if we say that Russia is aware uh, of its theology in some sense, uh, different from the West, it means that Russia will uh, act to respond to this theology first politically uh, and then theologically. Uh, it is known that the uh, first uh, revolutionary uh, in Russia uh, are Romanovs. Uh, it is the power uh, uh, government itself. So uh, all the changes uh, which concern the relations between uh, Russia and modernity uh, will, I would say, begin politically in Russia, firstly. Uh, and for, for the second question, I would say that uh, when I refer to nom nominalist researchers and cited, the, uh, don't cite it, but refer to them, I was referring to two uh, authors from the United States and from the uh, United Kingdom uh, who actually never cited each other. It is John Milbank uh, and his uh, radical orthodoxy and uh, Gillespie, uh, Michael Allen Gillespie. Both uh, conducted a genealogy uh, of the secular and uh, modernity from nominalism. And both came to this uh, conclusion that uh, it is nominalism that is the origin of modernity. In general, to look uh, um, for the roots of the West beyond the borders of modern times, uh, it emerges a postmodern trend and uh, this uh, um, uh, approach uh, comes from 1980s. Uh, it is the time uh, when the political theology began uh, to develop actively. Uh, postmodern political theology. And I think my, myself even more radically, if I may uh, say, not nominalism is the starting point of modernity, but those theological disputes that took place in the first millennium. Uh, and both uh, researchers, uh, which I meant, uh, mentioned, uh, they cannot be accused for disliking the West. Uh, on the contrary, they are very worried about the West uh, and uh, they were uh, that the West lacks spiritual arguments against Islamism. And uh, I would say that uh, the search for the origin of modernity uh, is for them an attempt to save the West as a global uh, project, as a global, I would say, modernity itself. Thank you. Matthew? Um, yeah, so if I understood it correctly, the, the question was, is it, not only in a, is, it, is it not only in a regime in which the highest authority is subject to God that freedom of conscience can be protected? That was, that was approximately it, wasn't it, Nick? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I, think, I think that that is theoretically true, um, but I think that historically um, it becomes difficult to assert that without, without equivocation because... Um, uh, uh, it seems to me that it's only in a regime in which uh, only a, a regime a regime in which a regime in which the highest authority is subject to God is only possible in a society which at least nominally or or, or, or notionally recognizes its it, it's it's you know uh, its whole subjection to God. You know you cannot have, for example, a Christian monarch ruling a body of people who don't acknowledge themselves um, as as being somehow bound by the moral idea of. Christianity. Um, so if you can only have a Christian 
if you can only have a, have a high authority that is bound to God in in the context of 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 a, of a of a society that notionally at least as a whole submits to the same ideas, then how do you ensure if you're the high authority that the rest of the society beneath you will go on maintaining its subscription or adherence to the same moral religious idea um, if you are to permit them full freedom of conscience. And I think that this is very much the situation that Russia find, found itself in historically in, in 1904, um, when the Tsar authorized um, in, in, in an edict at Easter 1904, freedom of conscience. If you're, in other words, if you're going to assert that Russia is a theocratia, united around subscription to, to the, the moral religious idea of orthodoxy, what do you do if, you know, 176 million subjects decide no longer to be orthodox. Um, should you, as the, should you, as the ruler, you know, somehow put a limit or 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 or, or, or um, some sort of prohibition on the extent of their freedom for the sake of um, preserving a correct uh, theolog a correct political order, an order oriented that is towards the moral religious idea. I think that. Notionally speaking, and you, know, you find this in, 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 in any number of papal encyclicals, for example, yes, a properly ordered um, uh, polity um, where the highest authority is ordered towards God is one that will also protect freedom of conscience. And I think theoretically that works, but how historically um, that can, in, in, at least in a modern context, um, that can be, um, whether that can be verified um, or sustained is is another question, and I actually, I, it's what I think is part of the the you know, the tragic nature, if you like, of, of Russian history in the twentieth century, um, that you have two competing ideals that, you know, as I said before, Bulgakov sets out very nicely, tearing in opposite directions mm -hmm. in the name of the same moral religious um, complex. I think we have time for one more question because we're running a little bit over. Although I must say, listening to what Matthew was saying, I'm not sure I would put, uh, I'm not sure I see a qualitative difference between that theological issue and a modern theological issue, like how to reconcile freedom of speech in the internet with control over fake news. <laughs> that strikes me also as one of those yeah. abstract uh, theological delving into the realm of, of we need an theocracy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of these kind of um, in, in ways, difficult ways to square the, the, the circle that we live in, you know, that we're actually confronted with every day. But, and, but to do that, Nick, without moving into, no, into the realm of nominalism, I think is the challenge. Right. Well, the, the last question, can be, uh, and anybody should feel free to, to jump in on this. Can Berdyaev and Bulgakov be described as liberals? This is by Paul Robinson. As they sometimes are for part of their, or were for part of their, their careers. No. <laughs> I, well, I think what happens with them is I think, and this is my experience, if people are kind of ideologically uh, committed to either either a liberal or a conservative position. If the person's committed to a conservative position or uh, an egregore, we could say, that of course they'll interpret them as liberals. But if you go to a liberal, they'll interpret them as conservatives. Uh, what I think, and I would I wouldn't say either one of those. I would I think what's what's important uh, about those two thinkers, and I, and I think this. Uh, is an outgrowth of sociology, of their sociologies, is that that kind of phenomenological attention to things in the world as they are, uh, is what allowed them or what, you know, provided them with an opportunity to, to kind of cut through the liberal conservative divide and to speak to what is, I mean, well, however you wanted to agree with them or disagree with their conclusions. But I think that's what, what's more that's going on. I think it's the same thing with Solovia, with Florence, with Florovsky. Is the term liberal conservative, which they sometimes, I believe, used to define themselves, uh, what do we do with that term today? 
What does who do with that term? Well, what can can it be used today meaningfully? Oh, I don't think it can. <laughs> I think, but I think that's the way the world's structured right now. Wow. You know, the polarities we see. I mean, I think especially, uh, you know, aggravated and instigated by social media and things like this. I, I, you could say, I like pizza and someone's gonna, <laughs> do you want meat on it or not? Because if you want meat on it, you're, 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 a, you're a conservative, <laughs> you know? People, it gets automatically uh, in, in this environment. And I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to do about that, but I, I, other than to, to fall back on that kind of phenomenological, sociological attention to things which is in a way antithetical to the technical, this is why I think Berjaev was always uh, going on about the, the dangers of technology, you know, that he saw the dangers of, of growing technology with as part and parcel of the dehumanization of persons, right? And, of, and, of, and ultimately of uh, totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. so that's what he was concerned about. And I think that that sociological background allowed him to be honest about it. Paul, I I I think that part of the the, the question comes up. I think Paul, uh, in part because if you if you read um, not just <clears throat> uh and Bulgakov, but also you know, other Russian thinkers of the period um, like Georgi Fedotov. I think it'd be a really good example is, is that there's a, in all of them, there's this really clear commitment, a passionate commitment to freedom. Um, in the case of Fyodotov, um, there's also a real commitment to democracy, in, in fact, uh, is, 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 is quite interesting. And, and for that reason, Fyodotov, uh, by some Russian liberals today, is, is sort of brought forward along with Solovyov as, as sort of in their camp. So I can, I can see why the question comes up. But I think in, Within the definitional framework of our discussion so far today, I think you could you could I, I think you would have to say that none of them are would define themselves or the or the political ideal as being wholly within modernity. Uh, and, and and I think the particularly interesting case here is is Fedotov, um, who's who, who makes such a stress on, on freedom in, in all of his writings, but says that the sources of freedom and of modern rights actually come from the pre-modern period itself and, and from Christianity. And, and, and when Vidodov defines what the Russia, what the true Russia is, he says it, it's pre-Petrine Russia. Right. It's actually medieval Russia. Right. It's actually it, the Novgorod it, Republic. Respublika Svetoy Saki. <laughs> yeah. So and, and you know, and, and of course, you know, but and, and I think Martin uh, Michael Michael's already adequately addressed the case of Volkakov and, and Berdyaev. Well, uh, I think we're we're well over time, and uh, we overfulfilled the plan. If I hear, <laughs> we're That's definitely great. going to uh, be posting this on the Simon Weil Center uh, website. And um, are there any other plans uh, to uh, open the, that discussion uh, or that site up for discussion? I, I, I'm not really sure. We're going to have more seminars for sure. This is clearly fun and useful. <laughs> um, and we'll brainstorm about how to broaden the scope of the dialogue. Um, yeah. yeah. But Ines yeah, Susanna, why don't you uh, say, uh, say thank you to all of our kind participants? <laughs> I was just going to. Um, thank you so much for coming. And I do also want to invite all of you who are uh, participating to consider writing for our new journal landmarks, um, which I think is going to be another um, place where these kinds of discussions can go on. Um, and yeah, just stay tuned for more notices of more such conversations. And with that, um, <laughs> thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you it was fascinating. Thanks. I'm